Indian Culture Cafe event of the year. Hosted by the School of Media and Culture Studies at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Cal Cultural Cafe is a space for dialogue on issues concerning media, culture, and society. It features film screenings, discussion, performances, talks, and other events that move us to think critically and discuss actively. So today, we have with us Dr. Faisal Devji uh, to de deliver a talk titled Ambedkar and the Politics of Interest. Dr. Faisal Devji is, uh, Dr. Faisal Devji is university reader in model, uh, modern South Asian history and the director of the Asian <laughs> Studies Center at St. Anthony's College, University of Oxford. He had held faculty positions at the New School in New York, Yale University, and U University of Chicago, from where he also received his PhD in intellectual history. Dr. Devji is the author of four books, Landscapes of Jihad, Militancy, Mor Morality, Modernity, 2005, The Terrorist in Search of Humanity, Militant Islam and Global Politics, 2009, The Impossible India, Gandhi and the Temptation of Violence, 2012, and Muslim Zion, Pakistan as a Political Idea, 2013. He is interested in Indian political thought as well as that of modern Islam. Devji's broader concerns have to do with ethics and violence of the globalized world. With us, we have our own very uh, Dr. Shilpa Fatke, who will be chairing the event. Over to you, sir. Faisal, and many of the students here are familiar with his work because we teach his work in our course, and I hope other courses are also familiar with it. Really, really happy to have you, Faisal. Thank you very much for inviting me. And, and for that generous introduction. Uh, I, I've been warning Shilpa repeatedly that um, this is not a lecture, but rather a set of reflections, which I hope will prompt um, a good discussion uh, afterwards. I am not uh, a specialist on the work of Ambedkar, but like almost everyone who is interested in modern India, um, Ambedkar uh, is of great interest to me. Uh, he has, as you know, become uh, a new, a controversial figure. And we can talk about some of that uh, controversy perhaps later. My reflections today have nothing to do uh, with contemporary controversies. Now, I want to begin with uh, a brief description of one aspect of the historiography of modern India, which I find curious. Uh, it's a historiography which is entirely dualistic in nature, or dyadic in nature, so that the various groups or movements uh, that become the subjects of this historiography are routinely placed in a dyadic relationship with some other one group. So if it's caste, it's always upper caste and lower caste. If it's community, it is always Hindu and Muslim. If it is class, it is always bourgeoisie and proletariat. Uh, if it's region, it's always North India and South India, etc. and variations thereof. There are very few attempts to draw links between these dyads. And the chief way of doing so is ironically one which relies upon the colonial state right? or the independent Indian state. And in, in terms of the colonial state, it's the hoary and well-born thesis of uh, divide and rule that gets to be the hinge connecting up one dyad to another. Uh, this form of thinking curiously continues uh, even today in the new politics that we see emerging from the 1990s. Not only what Christophe Jaffero has called the rise of the low castes in, in northern India, but also the movement for an alliance of uh, groups that have been oppressed, suppressed, discriminated against, uh, etc. And we know that there are several such movements uh, around, uh, very largely in North India, which is an interesting fact in its own right. Uh, 
And these movements of alliance building are also, I think, um, marked by the dyadic structure that characterizes the historiography, which they at the same time seek to surmount. But it's very difficult to do so. It's very difficult to move beyond the figure of the state as the mediating third party, just as the colonial state was the agent uh, that um, both divided, apparently, supposedly divided groups from one another, but also at the same moment brought them together. Um, you know that, um, uh, to begin somewhat blasphemously, a talk on a baker with a, a quotation from Gandhi, uh, that in Hind Swaraj, <laughs> Gandhi um, famously says that the, it's his version of the divide and rule thesis, right? Uh, where he says that the problem of communal conflict arises from the fact that there exists a, an agent, the colonial state in this case, which presents itself as a neutral third party and mediator between the different elements of Indian society. And it is precisely this effort at mediation that constructs these elements into interest groups. Uh, he goes on further to say that the conflict, in this case communal conflict, but you can think of caste conflict and other forms of conflict as well, that this conflict um, is the result of um, the loss of responsibility uh, over India's future, right? So that it is precisely because, in this case, Hindus and Muslims are no longer responsible for their own future and that of their country, that they have the luxury, and that word is Gandhi's, the luxury uh, to fight with one another because they know that at the end of the day, the colonial state exists to pick up the pieces. They don't have to worry about it. Um, and this is what presents the problem, that the, the presence of the state as a neutral mediating third party uh, makes the elements of Indian society, constructs them into interests and interest groups in a competitive fashion. They no longer have to deal directly with one another. They go through the state, whether colonial or indeed independent. And they become, as it were, equivalents of one another, despite a rhetoric that is always trying to differentiate each from the other, right? In the following kind of logic. Look, uh, they have X benefit. We should have it too. Or we are a minority. We should have Y protection. Or we are a majority. We should have Z position or status. So all of these attempts at differentiation ironically end up constructing these elements, what I'm calling elements of Indian society, into equivalents, oddly, and competitors of one another. And this is only possible because of the mediating and neutral role, apparently neutral role, of the colonial and perhaps later the independent state. I'll come back to this thesis of Gandhi's on how interests are made. And of course, they are not only made in this way, they are made by the externalization of identity through the census, uh, through law, uh, personal law, for instance, through representations such as separate electorates and reservations, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of which go through the state and that reinforce its character as a neutral or mediating third party. Uh, and so it is the, the very making of Indian groups into interest groups that makes, in Gandhi's view, for the violence of the modern. And it is uh, these interests that Ambedkar also uh, takes up in a very different way. Now, if we move away from this historiography for which the state, the colonial state, is so important, we see that uh, 
the dyadic structure of um, Indian society, the way Indian society is conceived of, falls apart very quickly, right? Outside the various mediations of the state. Uh, so that if we are trying to put together, for instance, the logic, otherwise dyadic, of caste on the one hand and community on the other, there could be others, of course, gender, region, etc., right? Uh, but let's take caste and community uh, for the moment. Uh, you see that um, they're inseparable from each other, that you cannot think one without the other. But historically, or rather historians, have insisted on thinking one without the other. If you think about the legend of the, the legend in the sense that the, the founding, the mythological charter of the Indian mutiny, of the what are we going to call it, the first war of independence, 1857. Uh, it's well known how um, in that mythological charter it is the figure of caste and of untouchability um, that makes for various kinds of relations. Right? So you, I'm sure you all know the story. Um, it's very popular. Uh, it has to do with the fact that uh, a high caste sipoi, sipahi, refuses to give water uh, to uh, a Dalit uh, laborer uh, and the laborer then tells him you who are so proud of your caste and your privileges you don't realize what's going to happen to you you don't realize what the British have planned for you they're going to break your caste uh, and you will be your pride will be destroyed so this is the, we don't know if this actually happened or not, but this has been part of the narrative, both among the mutineers and among the British, right, for different reasons. And very interestingly, um, he includes both the upper caste Hindu figure uh, who is being referred to, who refuses the water, but also the Muslim figures. Right? So the work caste is doing in this narrative is, is quite interesting. Because on the one hand, it's br it is the figure of the, as he was called then, the untouchable, that allows for the coming together of Hindu and Muslim in this narrative structure, right? Um, both as equivalent as upper caste figures. Um, so the bringing together of the category Hindu and the category Muslim is made possible by the excluded third, the figure of the untouchable. Um, and it's an interest. It's interesting how this, or even why this happens, because of course, technically, um, the logic doesn't hold. Right? There would be nothing preventing an upper caste individual from giving water to a lower caste individual in some other fashion, right? um, in some other hierarchical and demeaning fashion. Nor would they be for a Muslim to give water um, to such a figure. So, uh, you know. The story doesn't depend on theoretical rules of purity and pollution, nor perhaps even on actual practices. It's a different kind of thing that's happening. It's a form of triangulation. So here it's not the state that's mediating. There's a triangulation between these three groups, if you will. Um, and I'm just focusing on these three. There could be any number of other groups who could be similarly invoked. So at the very beginning of, as it were, Hindu-Muslim relations, modern, the modern modernity of Hindu-Muslim relations in India, the mutiny, you have the figure of caste. Always elided from the historiography, never there. Only mentioned in terms of this legend. All right. But the legend is never reflected upon. Right. But it, it goes to show, I think, that one can't divorce one from the other. Um, by the time you get to the 1920s, um, you have, uh, and the thing about triangulation, of course, is that the mediation, the role of mediator can move from one party to another. Right? So by the time you get to the 1920s, you have the following kind of scene, legend or mythological charter, which Gandhi mentions and Ambedkar quotes right, in one of his books. And it's a curious instance where someone writes to Gandhi um, and then Gandhi reproduces this in either Harijan or Young India and says, oh, isn't it awful? Um, 
how these forms of caste discrimination exist. And this is the story. There is um, a low caste uh, woman who is giving birth or has given birth. There are complications. The high caste doctor is called upon. He refuses to touch the woman or the child. And a, a Muslim is called upon to play mediator. So the thermometer has to be taken by the Muslim and given and then taken back by the Muslim. And the, the touch of, this is so interesting. As mediator, the Muslim serves as a, almost as a, a, an antiseptic medium. Right? So the touch of the Muslim, otherwise itself not pure necessarily, serves to sterilize the instrument. Um, and the high caste doctor can then take the thermometer back. And both Gandhi and Ambedkar were struck by this story to the degree that Ambedkar quotes from Gandhi, quotes this story from Gandhi, right? Uh, because it shows, I think, another form in, uh, in, in which this triangulation occurs, which is not the kind of mediation as operated by the colonial state. These are not interests being created, right? Um, so I want to look at these two forms of mediation. One in which there is this triangular relationship uh, where each of these parties can play the mediating role, but none of them can be talked about without the presence of the other in some fashion. And the other in which the idea of the neutral state, colonial and independent, uh, ends up constructing interests and interest groups, and therefore makes a set of relations. Um, of course, by the time um, uh, Gandhi and Ambedkar are discussing this example that I just mentioned, um, you have the politics of interest uh, that I've been talking about uh, in a newly dominant form. This is after all the period of separate electorates, of, um, uh, of increasing representation of Indians, still not never more than 12 percent, but you know, uh, with the promise of more to come, uh, the rise of mass politics, uh, etc. Right? All of which, of course, uh, play into or are part of what I'm calling a politics of interest. Uh, when people like Ambedkar or Gandhi, or as I shall proceed to discuss. Jannah or Iqbal think about this situation and they think about them rather differently um, they are filled with a certain anxiety um, Gandhi as I have suggested thinks that the politics of interest created by the colonial state is violent in its own way in its own right but it is violent not because it dominates the whole of Indian society, but precisely because it cannot, it never can. It's never possible for the entirety of social relations to be defined in terms of interest, in terms of externalized identities. That there are all kinds of relations that must exist between Indians of all kinds that are taken for granted every day, unspoken, that do not rely upon and cannot rely upon the self-presentation of oneself as an interest group. I am part of a majority, I am part of a minority, I am part of such and such a group. Uh, that informs a certain number of relations, but can never inform, in his view, in Gandhi's view, all of them. And that is where the violence comes in. It's unable to hegemonize the whole of society and social relations. And yet it is dominant, it has a dominant place in, in political, institutional political life. For someone like Jinnah, um, these institutionalized interests are also unreal, but in a different way. Um, he thinks that um, Hindus and Muslims constructed as minorities and majorities, uh, it sounds perfectly reasonable in theory, but is impossible in practice. Why is it impossible in practice? Because, as he says repeatedly, the Muslims are not a minority and the Hindus are not a majority. The Hindus are not a majority because 
Hinduism is, and he takes a page out of the um, apologists of Hinduism here. Hinduism is a diverse phenomenon, and it is divided in caste terms. So you cannot specify it as a single thing, no matter how hard people try to make it such. Uh, Muslims are not a minority because they are very large in real terms, in terms of numbers. He says, look, how can a population that constitutes nearly 25% of the total of British India be considered a minority, especially when the numbers in real terms are so large that they are more than any Europe, Western European state. Um, and in both, so in this way, the Muslims cannot be a minority. They also cannot be a minority because they form majorities in two parts of the country in two quite large parts of the country. So the problem of India for Jinnah then is that these interest groups that have been created through the politics of representation, etc., cetera, um, create violence be precisely because they don't have any real, any reality to them. Right? Muslims are not a minority, Hindus are not a majority. Even where these groups claim to be majorities, they in fact form pluralities in certain places. Right? Um, so in Bengal and Punjab, where Muslims claim to be a majority, they are in fact just slightly more than 50%. It's a plurality, it's not a majority. If you were to um, divide Hindus by caste then and exclude Dalits and Adivasis, then they would not form, etc. And this is the source of the violence, he thinks. And indeed, we know during the roundtable conferences when um, Ambedkar and Jinnah and others come together in the Minorities Pact, um, the Minorities Pact is all about showing that there is neither a majority nor a minority in India. So, how do you conceive of the society if you cannot? define it in demographic terms. And demography is one of the ways in which interests are defined, right? Because people argue either for statutory dominance or for statutory protections on the basis of the numbers, among other things. Uh, the minority, minority Pact has not received as much attention as it warrants. It is what comes before the Pune Pact. The Pune Pact has received justifiably and is continuing to receive a lot of attention. And you know what that's about. Uh, that's about the, in, you know, epoch, epochal struggle between Gandhi and Ambedkar on representation of Dalits, on whether or not they are to receive separate electorates, which had been put in place for Muslims. Right? Again, you see the triangulation and the mediation operating here. Right? Isn't it curious that the scholarly work, good as it is, on the Pune Pact uh, shirks away, shrinks almost away from acknowledging, recognizing, and dealing with the fact that what the struggle is about is also the institution of a very distinct form of minority protection by and for Muslims that here is being extended. It's being extended in a situation where Dalits, where Ambedkar is trying to, for the moment, describe Dalits as being a minority. This is the result of the Minorities Pact, which of course is not approved of. We know the Roundtable Conference has resulted in nothing, and therefore you have the communal award and all that. But to look at the scholarship is interesting, and it's a good scholarship, so much of it. It's interesting because you see how this, what I'm calling the dyadic structure of Indian historiography, continues to operate into our own time. Barely a mention of the Minorities Pact, and yet you can't have the Pune Pact without the Minorities Pact. In other words, you can't have a discussion of upper and lower caste Hindus without also having a discussion about Hindus and Muslims. Um, so let me... Um, read you something uh, from Ambedkar, which is by way of commenting upon what I've just said. Right? So th this is from a letter to A.V. Alexander, uh, who was one of the members of the cabinet mission in 1946. 
all right, sent to India to negotiate a constitutional arrangement after the war. And he says, to my mind, it is only right to say that, Hindus and the, that the Hindus and the Muslims are today mentally incompetent to decide upon the destiny of this country. Both Hindus and Muslims are just crowds. It must be within your experience that a crowd is less moved by material profit than by a passion collectively shared. It is easier to persuade a mass of men to sacrifice itself collectively than to act upon a cool assessment of advantages. A crowd easily loses all sense of profit and loss. It is moved by motives which may be high or low, genial or barbarous, compassionate or cruel, but is always above or below reason. The common sense of each is lost in the emotion of all. It is easier to persuade a crowd to commit suicide than to accept a legacy. Now, it's a beautifully written passage and it's very interesting in all kinds of ways. I'd ask you to dwell particularly on these words and these themes, which are so interesting. Legacy, um, material profit, uh, cool assessment of advantages, interests, basically. And he seems to be suggesting that um, you see how, in a quite different way, but it's, it's the same debate that's occurring here. Uh, the way in which Gandhi, when talking about the neutral third party and the inability of interest politics to colonize the whole of Indian society, um, you know, that way of thinking about the limits of interest uh, is related to Jinnah's, what I describe as Jinnah's ways of doing so by saying, look, these groups, Hindu and Muslim, are not interest groups, can never be interest groups. In fact, India doesn't have a minority or a majority. We have to think of other categories for it. And here we have Ambedkar saying, Hindus and Muslims are just crowds. They are incompetent to decide upon the future of this country. These three ways of thinking about the problem posed by interest politics and its limits are very different. They, go, you know, they represent different trajectories, and yet, all these three figures are talking about the same thing. Right? Now, Gandhi, very much like Iqbal, Muhammad Iqbal, the poet and philosopher, is critical of interest, of interest politics. He distrusts it. Uh, he's much more attuned um, to what he thinks is the fundamentally disinterested nature of Indian social relations. And if you think about Gandhi's words and texts, they're all about, you point to instances of sacrifice for him is crucial. Look, Indian society is full of sacrificial actions. You think that you know, people are driven by the interest, and then they sacrifice themselves. They sacrifice themselves in their family lives, parents for children, children for parents, lovers for each other, and they sacrifice themselves in their political lives. Right? People die. They do more than die. They sacrifice their own entire groups. And we see this over and over again in Indian society. Right? So this society whose politics can reasonably and legitimately be characterized as being driven by interest, even more, perhaps more driven by interest than any other society in the world, than any other politics in the world, is also and at the same moment a society dominated by, as for disinterest in the form of sacrifice. Gandhi is interested in limiting the politics of interest and playing upon the transcendental motifs, uh, you know, prejudices, forms of love, etc., that he thinks are inherent in Indian society and that represent its forms of disinterest. He would like to separate one from the other. Iqbal too, uh, I won't go into Iqbal too much here, but uh, thinks along these lines. Jinnah and Abedkar think completely different. So Jinnah, like Ambedkar in this quotation I have just read, uh, sees the limits of interest politics, uh, but he, Jinnah and Ambedkar, um, they think that this poses a problem. They are not willing to give in, to, to trust um, the forms of, as it were, sacrificial mobilization that people like Gandhi or Rick Bahan are interested in, right? And this is, after all, what Ambedkar is saying. He might easily be describing Gandhi, right? 
he's saying um, uh, it is easier to persuade a mass of men to sacrifice itself collectively than to act upon a cool assessment of advantages. Um, a crowd easily loses all sense of profit and loss. It is moved by motives which may be high or low, genial or barbarous, compassionate or cruel, but is always above or below reason. Uh, and it's as if he's saying, here is what I make of the transcendent or transcendental politics of Gandhi, the mobilizations of Gandhi. These ethereal moments of great sacrifice, these things that are above reason, right, uh, which cannot be defined by self-interest and rationality. You think these are great. I think this, these are simply the other side of the coin of barbarousness. Right? That they are part of the same logic as barbarity. The crowd that is moved to sacrifice itself non-violently is the same crowd um, that will kill. And this is because it has no integrity. These are simply crowds. Hindus and Muslims are just crowds. They are not constituted as interests, as Gandhi himself recognized, as Iqbal, as Jinnah recognized. The task then is not to limit the politics of interest, but to fulfill it, uh, to advocate it. Um, he doesn't have the luxury to return to that word that Gandhi likes. Ambedkar doesn't have the luxury to play around with these things. He sees each, the barbarity and the transcendence, uh, the being above reason or being below reason as part of the same logic. Uh, and that is the logic of the limitations, the lack of hegemony of interest politics in Indian society, which is what allows it to be consummately self-interested at the one hand, at one level, and barbarous or disinterested, depending on your stance, uh, on the other. Now you might ask yourself, fine, this is a very interesting analysis. I certainly happen to think so. But who is Ambedkar talking about? Who is to be constituted as an interest of this kind? Are the Dalits going to be constituted as interests in this way, accepting a legacy, a cool uh, assessment of uh, advantages, of material profits? What is this constituency? That, Iqbal, that Ambedkar wants to represent, which is not property. He's talking the language of property here. And Jinnah does so in the same way. Who is he talking about? What does he mean? It's a problem. It's quite interesting. Maybe he's just talking about Hindus and Muslims. After all, that's who he mentions. These are the people who are incompetent to decide upon the future of this country. Um, it's a curious thing. But, but you know, there's a long tradition of this. So as early as Hobbes, the canonical figure of modern political thought, uh, you have this idea that if people are not attached to property of some kind, then they are, as it were, loose cannons. Right? They cannot have genuine interests if they have nothing to anchor them, to ground them, to hold them in place. And what does that? preeminently property of various kinds, not just landed property. That's what makes them interested in the survival and development of society. If they have nothing to lose, as it were, then they are just free agents, they are free radicals that can do anything, they can destroy society. We need to anchor them. So the anxiety of someone like Hobbes is to, you know, how do you make interest possible in property ways? All of these figures, whether it's a Gandhi or an Ambedkar or a Jinnah or an Iqbal, realize this in various ways. Um, you know, Gandhi and Iqbal, I'm arguing, are very distrustful of property and interest. They think that its hegemony would be ruinous uh, if successful, but that it can never be successful. If, uh, Jinnah and Ambedkar, I want to argue, recognize the limitations of the politics of interest, but want to fulfill it in some other fashion. For Ambedkar, the paradox is, how can you talk about interests for Dalits? And he's very clear. He refuses, it was at the Simon Commission, where he writes and says, you know, where he's asked, well, you know, what about, you? do you represent the oppressed of the earth or something? And he says, no. I'll tell you who I represent. I represent this group of people. I do not want to generalize and say, 
every person in the whole world who is, he knows what it is to make an interest. But he also runs that the interest has to be made. It doesn't pre-exist. How is it to be made without the logical property which he himself is mentioning here, uh, focusing on here? And now that is the question. Um, so what Jinnah does is say, if we can't resolve our difficulties, then we must redistribute political responsibility in India, eventually partition it. Uh, his reasoning for doing so, there are many reasons, but the ones that interest me are the is the following. The problem of India is there's no proper majority and there's no proper minority, and yet we continue using these words, these categories, and we make laws that are based upon them, and we have separate electorates, and we have all of these things. We can't come to an agreement. So what we need to do is actually create proper majorities and minorities. They don't exist. How do we create them? Well, there are many ways of doing so. You can reapportion India or you can partition it as eventually happens. What happens in the partitioning? You make Hindus into a proper majority. Immediately they become a majority in India, partition in India. And Muslims become a minority. In Pakistan, you have the opposite. Right? Um, and once you make proper, in his words, majorities and minorities in these two countries, then he believes idealistically and falsely, as it turns out, that the religious element and the mobilization and violence along these lines of religious communities interest will die down. So this famous speech of um, the 11th of May, 1947, that all every Pakistani secularist, they are much reduced in numbers, but those who exist will cite, right? Where he says, Jinnah says, you are free to go to your temples and your mosques and your gurdwaras. You, you know, religion is no part of being a Pakistani citizen and everyone is equal and all the rest. And th this is not a vault fast. This is not him having suddenly turned his back on his work of two decades right? or of a decade. Pakistan is only produced within about 10 years. It's extraordinary. The Lahore Resolution where Pakistan is demanded is 1940. Seven years later, they have it. It's the most, it's the quickest and most, in quote, successful national movement I've come across, right? It has no time to develop itself. It has no national movement, really, really speaking. So here he's saying, okay, now we have proper majorities and minorities, so now we can have a proper citizenship, which turns out to be curiously exactly the Congress's idea of citizenship. So after partition, Jinnah, while he's alive, the few months he's alive, returns to his old persona as a congressman. Of course, it doesn't last. In India, he tells the Muslims of India, you are now a minority. Yesterday, you were, in, you know, they come to him. In 1946, he's giving speeches in UP, and he says, today we are a nation. Tomorrow, you will be a, min a sub-national minority. You're not, not. Can you imagine his hearers? They're thinking, hang on. Here, we've been calling ourselves a nation, the two-nation theory, remember? And once Pakistan is created, we are, fit, we are not a nation any longer. What does it mean to be a nation? But for Jinnah, it was a purely constitutional thing. It had no existential depth, right? Uh, you will be a minority, and this is a good thing. The problem was always that you were never a minority. That was the problem. So you will now be a minority, and Hindus will be a majority. And because uh, this happened, once this happens, then the communal elements will, re uh, you know, will go back, will disappear. Again, not something that happened. But this is Jinnah's way of trying to create interests of a different kind. Communities cannot be interest groups, he says, because India has neither majority nor minority. There is an attempt made, not just by him, by many others, to try to reconceive Indian politics and perhaps politics in general. It doesn't work, so now you create this. This is my schematic way of describing what happened. Ambedkar does something more successful um, and perhaps more interesting. In this period in which Jinnah is um, speaking and thinking, he is shackled uh, to the Muslim League in a curious way. Remember I talked about the Minorities Pact. From the Minorities Pact onwards, 
he is shackled because the Muslim League is the largest and most powerful, most important opposition party, opposition group to the Indian National Congress. Any other group that wants to be in opposition to the Congress has willy-nilly to follow or to ally itself with the Muslim League. That includes Ambedkar is off and on, right? Periyar is much more uh, attached to the Muslim League. They enter into an arrangement. So the Muslim League hegemonizes or dominates opposition politics by sheer numbers and it has more wealth and all the rest for various reasons. And so he has to, as it were, cut his cloth through that pattern. So initially he says he tries to make Dalits into a minority, just as Muslims are minority. Then he's, you have the Pune Pact intervening, so he cannot claim separate electorates. But once you get to the 40s and Pakistan becomes uh, kind of uh, uh, accepted as a fact, Ambedkar returns to separate electorates. He wants them. Uh, and he's in the 30s and 40s forever pitching his demands in line with the Muslim League's demands. So he'll always say, look, if the Muslim League gets this amount of seats or this amount of representation, I must get at least 50% of what they're getting. In a sense, it's a humiliating position to be in, to follow the league. Not following it because he agrees with it. Because it, being the greatest oppositional force in Indian politics, creates the way. Uh, and Baker is, he struggles and he's torn and he does it. And it's curious, you know, I had a quote which I forgot to bring here. So on this famous day of deliverance, you know, when um, Congress, in 1937 elections, Congress comes into power in many of the provinces, right? And in 1939, when war is declared, it resigns office for various reasons, which we can discuss. And when it resigns office, Jinnah declares the day of deliverance, right? That because we are being oppressed by Hindu Raj, he says. And on, in this day of deliverance, you have Ambedkar, Jinnah, and Sabaka on the same platform, you know, saying, thank God we've been saved from Congress rule. Right? Now imagine these three guys, right? Each one different from the other. Right? There they are. They come together. And Gandhi writes a famous letter to Jinnah, and he publishes it in Young India, I think, mm -hmm. saying, now you have truly become a national leader. This is wonderful because now you're arguing not just for Muslims. You're arguing for a pan-Indian movement of opposition to the Congress. And though I am for the Congress, I realize the value of an opposition. And if you play your cards right, you will be the first Prime Minister of an independent India. This is Gandhi writing to Jinnah, which was the wrong thing to do because of Jinnah writes the coldest letter imaginable back, saying, my dear Mr. Gandhi, I'm afraid you've misconstrued what I do. You know? um, so at this moment, Ambedkar writes, gives an interview to the Times of India in Bombay, and he says, it should, have been, it should have been me who raised this. Mr. Jinnah has stolen a march on me. It is the Dalits who should have been in the position of, Mr. Jinnah has complained of oppression under Congress rule. I can, I can complain and induce 100% more oppression against Dalits than the Muslims have suffered. Right? So you have this kind of competitive thing happening um, in which Ambedkar is forced to follow in the wake of the Muslim League and is resist and yet resisting it with all his might, all right? Um, it's a form of the mediation I started out with. But these are not yet two interest groups uh, set against each other. The language is that of theft and identification. Mr. Jinnah has stolen what should have been my right, all right? But I will join him on the stage along with Mr. Savarkar. Interesting you know, set of people, as I said. Um, and how does the Muslim League do this? Because it manages to occupy, as it were, both majority and minority aspects of politics in India. Right? So Ambedkar is interested in the Muslim League as a preeminent minority organization because Dalits are not a majority anywhere. Periyar's alliance with the Muslim League is fashioned out of an identification with it as a potential majority, because Muslims are majorities in two parts of the country, and 
non Brahmins or Dravidian, Dravidian nationalists are a majority in southern India, regional majority. So you see, the Muslim League can play two roles. It can play an all India role as a minority, as a representative of minority, and not just Muslims, because the minority fact is about all minorities. And it can play the role of a regional majority. So it can have Periyar on the one side and Ambedkar on the other side. It can play both roles because it's such an amorphous population that it claims to represent, Muslims. Right? Um, it occupies this political space, I think, and therefore forces, as I'm arguing, um, people like Periyar and Ambedkar uh, to follow along. But Jinnah eventually dismisses Periyar and says, you know, get lost, basically, after years of mutual support. Um, and Ambedkar, Peria is disappointed, Ambedkar realizes what's happening. So Ambedkar's distrust of Jinnah and the Muslim League is he thinks that the Muslim League is more interested in reaching an accommodation with upper caste Hindus, Congress, than it is of representing minorities more generally and oppressed groups like Dalits in particular. Right? So his, his texts are very, very interesting because he's constantly saying, if only the Muslim League, if only Mr. Jinnah would realize where the true interests of the Muslims lie. Right? But Mr. Jinnah is more interested in reaching an agreement with the Congress. He wants to perpetuate. He says that he's against Hindu Raj, but in fact he wants to perpetuate Hindu Raj. He wants an agreement between upper class Muslims and upper caste Hindus. As indeed might arguably have been the case. Right. Um, and so um, what happens, of course, is when Pakistan is declared, Ambedkar latches on to separate electorates after a long time. It's as if he's going to occupy the place left vacant by the Muslim, but to a very different purpose. And there's a great instance of this in um, Chaudhary Khaliku Zaman, who was the Jinnah's UP lieutenant, and who, when Jinnah goes off to be Governor General of Pakistan, for a while he stays in India, and he's in the Constituent Assembly um, as representative, representative of the Muslim League, uh, so writes in his autobiography that Ambedkar comes to see him and says, let's make a deal. Uh, if you support separate electorates, etc., for uh, Dalits, I will support the retention of separate electorates for Muslims. And when the time comes in the Constituent Assembly, according to Chaudhary Khaliku Zaman, uh, Ambedkar does not vote for the Muslims. And so the Muslim League votes against Ambedkar as well. So the moment of independence is a moment also of betrayal, mutual betrayal. Um, it's important to realize this. This is the prehistory of the current movement for alliance building between Muslims and Dalits, I would argue. It's, it's important to be, self -con to be conscious of this history, not least so as to understand the difficulties and of such an alliance which can never be merely instrumental. Uh, and uh, what happened? Ambedkar does not get separate electorates. He doesn't get Dalitistan. He's also thinking about a kind of, you know, you have Dravidistan, Pakistan, Dalitistan, you know, there are various, you see how the Muslim League so occupies opposition in the politics that other opposition movements which do not identify with the Muslim League could use its language, right? Um, so on the one hand, Ambedkar, as it were, takes over the place vacated by the Muslim League. But he takes over it very differently. What happens? He represents a population which is forever being torn away from him. Other people are claiming to represent it. Which does not have um, large uh, masses, uh, you know, masses of capital. Which cannot buy loyalty, which is not property in the same kind of way. How is it to be made into an interest? And in a way, Ambedkar returns to the founding moment of interest politics in colonial India and transforms it because what he seems to do 
is create Dalits or lower castes as an interest group through the state, through a politics that includes primarily reservations. Um, and it's as if you take the state and turn it against itself in this fashion. Um, so it's, he manages to, as if were, cut the Gordian knot because he no longer needs to re re uh, rely upon the Hobbesian form of property relations to make for interest politics. He does it through the state itself, but in a very different fashion than the divided rule state. You know, than the state that's playing the third. The state now is not the neutral mediator. The state has to be partisan in this fashion. Uh, so it's a way of actually taking the modern state and occupying it and turning it around uh, and making interests where they had been none. And in his sense, I think, with great and severe difficulties, he manages to do the thing that Jinnah was unable to do. Um, and he makes a group that no one, he, no one had imagined could be an interest, a political interest, into one uh, by attaching it in this fashion. So the comparison is instructive between Jinnah and Ambedkar, as it is between Periyar and Jinnah, or Gandhi uh, and Ambedkar. So I'll stop there, and we can take uh, questions or have a discussion. Thank you.